Well, it is indeed a pleasure to be here, and um, thank you so much for coming on a beautiful afternoon. Um, this is a, um, a slightly experimental talk, uh, because, partly because I was going to begin a project on regulating children's personal data um, in February, and somehow the start of the grant got pushed forward till now, so this is kind of thoughts fresh from the moment. Um, and uh, it is about the GDPR, General Data Protection Regulation, for those not um, uh, closely focused on such matters. But I want to focus on um, the broader questions of children's personal data and really focus in a little on questions of privacy, literacy and vulnerability. Uh, and I've put up pictures of children to remind me that uh, what I think I know about here is children more than um, some of the legal and technological questions that are going to um, uh, pepper my talk. And I'm very um, uh, curious to hear what the technologists, um, uh, lawyers, and um, perhaps others in the room are going to have to uh, contribute as part of the conversation that uh, Taha um, announced. So my, my starting point <coughs> is to say, um, uh, and all of these kind of keywords are, are really important to, to the work that I've been doing over some years and, and where I'm trying to go with um, some new work now. Um, so, as I say, every word is thought about. So I'm trying to think about children in the plural rather than the child. I'm trying to think about their participation online and, in fact, also offline within our society. Um, I'm responding to a series of pressing questions now, but really there are some... Um, uh, long-term questions about the ways in which children uh, act in ways that fulfil rather than undermine their rights. So I've got a kind of rights framework um, that I'm interested in. I'm thinking about children's development in terms of capacity or some would say um, capability and I don't know if there's any psychologists in the room but I sort of also have some questions um, about how much uh, developmental psychology can help us in thinking about children's uh, capacity to act and participate online. And then, um, uh, as Vicky said, I spend quite a lot of time working with uh, stakeholders in the world of um, children's online safety and other domains. So I'm also interested in the responsibilities of those others and indeed who those others um, might even uh, be. So um, I feel that the jigsaw puzzle with missing pieces is a really kind of important <coughs> metaphor for how I'm at least thinking about it. But I believe also uh, for how many stakeholders thinking about children's privacy uh, in, the, uh, in the online realm. Um, there are many missing pieces, and the pieces on the board, and even what the picture should be when we've got all the pieces <coughs> there, is um, changing quite fast at the moment, because Europe is seeing um, the uh, implementation of such a major piece of uh, legislation whose, I think, wider ramifications we are... Uh, getting to grips with as it unfolds and um, I don't think anyone ever thought the general data protection regulation was going to be a simple piece of uh, legislation but the kind of the, the, the widespread effects of uh, trying to regulate the way in which um, all the data that we all kind of uh, generate uh, through our online lives is having um, is generating a lot of debates among those who never thought that the GDPR as a word would kind of trip off their tongue um, and it does feel like these this is this is a kind of interesting moment in which um, uh, social norms are being um, rethought and reshaped and in which the uh, many people suddenly recognize that they do have um, there are privacy issues associated with the ways in which they use their technology in ways that they might not have thought of um, before so I'm not going to um, uh, say um, I'm, I'm going to focus on certain parts of the regulation and try to kind of show how behind the regulation there are a series of assumptions about children's real lives which is um, as I said well just the kind of heart of my concern um, so I'm not going to give an overview and maybe you've already sat through many overviews of this I have no idea um, but essentially um, it's a piece of legislation which comes into force across Europe in um, uh, 22 days time and there's a lot of clocks on the internet that are kind of ticking off and a lot of companies desperately trying to um, uh, prepare 
um, which specifies the responsibilities of data controllers, which is all of those who collect, store, um, and um, manage our um, personal data in any way. Um, of course, not necessarily digital, but largely digital these days. The rights of data subjects, which is what I'm particularly interested in, um, both because of the um, emphasis on rights and because um, it's, um, I think, a, quite an effort for all of us to think of ourselves as data subjects, but data subjects is a very kind of homogenizing term. Um, so for me, data subjects read children and young people. Um, and as a piece of legislation, it sets a whole set of requirements um, which have um, become, as it were, the language of uh, stakeholder negotiation for a host of things, not just privacy, but also um, safety and participation and speech and all kinds of other rights are now being kind of talked about in the language of GDPR rules for um, transparency, consent, access, erasure, profiling, breaches, use of sensitive data, and so forth. So um, one bit from the legislation, one bit from the regulation, which you may or may not be able to read. Is that possible at the back? No. OK, is it possible at the front? All right, so somewhere in the middle. So um, there are two bits that I really wanted to um, kind of focus on. Um, and one is about when is it, how, under what conditions is it lawful to process people's personal data? And the other is about the way in which the um, regulation makes specific uh, requirements for children. Um, and as I said, I'm not a lawyer, so I'm kind of reading these things and I'm talking to lawyers who are helping me uh, interpret what they think is happening. But it's very clear to me that even lawyers are working out what it means as it's kind of unfolding. And there's quite a lot of arguments. But what essentially it says is that, and I've just highlighted three points, you may process um, people's data if the data subject gives consent. And I want to unpack uh, in this talk a little bit what, what it means for a child to give consent. B, if the processing is necessary for the performance of a contract. Um, and there's a lot of questions about when it is that a child um, can uh, enter into a contract. Um, some others that I'm not going to focus on. And then when is processing necessary for the purposes of legitimate interests pursued by the controller? Except where such interests are overridden by the interests, fundamental rights, freedoms of the data subject, in particular where the data subject is a child. So the child, children, or the rights of the child are kind of built into the um, regulation here and there in ways that are, in fact, quite inconsistent through the um, regulation. But essentially, there is a question of when do you give consent and what is the capacity of the child to give consent for their data to be used? Um, when is it a matter of the performance of a contract? Um, and when does the uh, data controller, let's say Facebook, um, uh, need to process per personal data for um, the purpose of, quote, legitimate interests? And then there's been a very contested Article 8 in the regulation which has set, tried to set the age at which a child um, is deemed to have the capacity to give <coughs> consent. And for reasons which have um, uh, been rather little articulated, um, the uh, uh, regulators decided that the age would be 16. So at 16, a child is able to give consent for their data to be, um, for sensitive data to be uh, used, for their personal data to be um, the basis of profiling. Um, and um, it allowed member states to reduce that age to 13, 14, or 15, if they should wish. And I think everyone in this room, assuming you're online, and I did once, um, I did once speak at a, a conference of privacy lawyers where it turned out that nobody had any of their data online, so it's possible that, uh, that you're not. But I'm going to assume that uh, people are online. I think probably many people in this room had to update their Facebook settings and all kinds of other settings in the last few weeks. And many people will suddenly have become aware that there is a change in the regulation. I know my inbox is full of emails saying, because of GDPR, I want to make sure you're still on my mailing list. And actually, I'm delighted to drop off most of those mailing lists. But, um, uh, but I did go through the process um, on Facebook. And we can imagine that it's quite interesting that a kind of silent process has happened to everybody individually. And I don't know how much conversation there is in which people discuss what is going on when Facebook suddenly, but they suddenly um, asks us to update our data. But at this point, it became clear to everybody, perhaps if they were paying attention, didn't just click and accept, 
that some data was classified as sensitive, that Facebook was now about to start facial recognition of everybody, um, and that there were conditions, there were ways in which they're going to use this data uh, to um, profile and target and advertise to us, um, and that there was a set of um, updates to review. I haven't seen any research on this, but my guess is that most people just went click, 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 done, and didn't read it, except those of us who are um, uh, extraordinarily interested in the way in which um, there was some kind of quite interesting manipulative or let's say persuasive statements about why it is that you might want to have uh, Facebook do facial recognition so that you can't be scammed and have your um, data stolen in future, which is the way they put it. So um, quite a number of kind of changed all at once. Um, and this has just been a kind of a week in which those of us interested in children's data have been reeling with, oh, did you see the latest? So WhatsApp decided, interestingly, just despite being a company um, owned by Facebook, that um, it wouldn't bother with any of this and it would just say you've got to be 16 to use WhatsApp from now on. Um, and there's a lot of speculation about what will happen to the WhatsApp groups that parents and children have got going together um, and will they all be turned off on May 25th. Um, and um, WhatsApp's argument is that it will ask all users to confirm their age, all users to confirm their age, um, in the next um, couple of weeks, which is a very interesting uh, argument. Instagram seemed to decide that it would, um, and, and this came out just um, this week as well, that it was going to um, treat children under 18 uh, differently, which is puzzling because there's no mention of 18 in any legislation that I can find except for the Convention on the Rights of the Child, which does say a child is a... Um, so... If we just think a little bit about which of these services are children using and which are the services that are collecting children's data and what might it matter um, that these different companies are making different kinds of decisions about where children's, how children's data should be um, managed and at what age they should be asked um, to make various decisions about how that data will be processed. Um, we can see from, this is Ofcom's survey last year, that 55% of children aged 12 to 15 are on Facebook, of whom um, a certain proportion, the 12-year-olds, are using it below Facebook's own terms and conditions. 43% um, are on Snapchat. I don't know what Snapchat's going to do about the GDPR. I haven't seen that yet. 43% are on Instagram. So 43% of children aged 12 to 15 in this country presumably will have their WhatsApp turned off um, or... Perhaps they will just be asked to, maybe they lied about their age in the first place and they'll be able to carry on, and we don't know, um, and so forth. Some other um, social network platforms which are collecting children's data about which nobody really ever discusses very much, but I know some in the uh, internet safety community are very um, concerned about. At the same time, because we have a piece of reg um, new regulation which is adding um, burdens to companies to take greater responsibilities for the way in which they treat children's data, there are also new business opportunities. And I think this is um, the project that uh, Vicky has been uh, leading here in terms of thinking about the way in which well, companies can now, um, as children get restricted from some platforms or as it becomes more onerous to address the fact that children are using some platforms, there are also um, new business opportunities. And we see echoes of the GDPR and it's it kind of reshaping the way in which children can access services um, and what kinds of data are going to be used from services. So here's Microsoft saying, OK, now we're going to um, implement the GDPR for children's accounts and we're going to um, use the very high standards of COPPA to verify parental consent. It's a slight ironic twist there. Um, but um, nonetheless, uh, Microsoft is looking for children's accounts um, linked to their parents. Um, some of you might have noticed that there's been a whole kind of saga around YouTube in the last um, year in which um, all kinds of weird, sick mashups of YouTube, of, of kids' favourite characters have been appearing on YouTube. And uh, rather, YouTube has been addressing that. And of course, the sun puts the worst um, slant on it. Um, but at the same time, YouTube sees the opportunity to create um, child 
um, YouTube Kids with um, a whole host of parental uh, controls, which are kind of interesting because they're all about setting limits and content requirements and not very much about finding. But maybe there are, if I'm being unfair, maybe there are also ways of curating fabulous content and opportunities um, for kids there. Um, Amazon has just launched um, Alexa just for kids, so the um, tech can um, read your child a bedtime story, turn out their light, tuck them in and remind them where the PE kit is in the morning and you don't maybe need to do any of that. Um, so there's a whole kind of burgeoning market and it's raising a lot of questions about um, uh, what kind of services are being um, developed for children, what kinds of ways are there data being used, um, what is the role of parents and children in this, and so there is a lot of contestation uh, and controversy. Um, perhaps most evidently in the last few years as well, focusing on some of the um, data breaches that are that are resulting from the way in which um, when children's, anyone's personal data is, um, is um, collected and kept and further used, there are all kinds of data breaches occurring which are getting a lot of publicity. So here's one stat in 2017, <coughs> a million children in the United States were victims of identity theft. So the questions of who's responsible, um, who should be knowing about this, do children and parents know about it, do those whose data was stolen, are they made aware of it, who, pay, who takes that responsibility? Um, this is um, my friend Kayla uh, at the European Parliament, as it were, um, winning her case for um, data breach in which her children's voices were uh, collected as they spoke to the doll and told the doll how they felt and what they um, were concerned about, um, and their voices were uh, hacked. And there she is. Um, um, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, advocates in the US um, brought a case to say that Google, YouTube is violating um, this now the US law, but it, I'm sure you know it's going to apply in um, Europe as well, because um, YouTube says it's just for age 13 up. It's being widely used, of course, everybody knows by under 13s. It's um, collecting all kinds of data, and what that personal data is, you know, it's a, it's a question, it, how do we think watching YouTube is collecting our personal data? Well, as they said, it's collecting geolocation data, unique device and um, identifiers, sometimes mobile phone numbers, um, ways of tracking users across devices and websites um, without um, parental permission, um, contra the rules of COPPA. Facebook has just brought out um, Messenger Kids, so again, another new service just for kids to um, be on Facebook with linked accounts to their parents, sorry, just to use a Facebook service with linked um, accounts to their parents so that their parents can kind of manage who is in their network, who it is that they're talking to, what kind of communications um, are getting shared. And my colleague Alicia Blum Ross just wrote on our blog a kind of for and against. And I think the for and against is important because there are a lot of ways in which parents and children are wanting to use services to communicate, to network, to share with others. Um, and there is a lot of anxiety about the way in which this is drawing ever younger children into the kind of um, uh, the, the world of surveillance capitalism, if you like, the world of um, datification, so that they become used to um, a mode of engagement and uh, interaction in which they are um, everything they do is recorded um, and um, data is generated and can be marketed further um, from their, as it were, their every casual interaction. There's been a, um, a further um, conversation, a, a, a lot of struggling around that age of consent that the GDPR uh, set. So here is um, a couple of screenshots from the, the for and against case um, as it's being fought right now in Ireland. Um, has it been set? 13. But, yeah, this, this is a very moving, fast moving story. There was a story that it was going to be 16. Um, and one of the interesting things about this question of the age of consent is it's somehow become um, blown up more than, I think a lot of people thought that the age of consent was going to be 
um, the way in which the, the, the age at which children could even use the platforms in the first place, and was going to a lot of the fight, which you can see here about how how old children should be, was not really about their capacity to consent to um, legislation. It was much more about their capacity to then manage themselves and um, uh, ensure their safety and security once they were on the platforms. And so, a lot of the kind of um, online. Uh, safety and risk concerns have found themselves suddenly kind of moving from an internet safety debate into a privacy debate and there's been a lot of people skilling up and making some um, mistakes along the way. Um, so there are some dilemmas that regulators are facing and uh, we held a meeting a, a, couple of week, uh, a couple of months ago at the LSE with the Information Commissioner's Office, which is the regulator in this country, to try to kind of argue through what some of those um, debates are going to be around interpreting and implementing the regulation. And what was very clear, um, I think, to everybody was how you, you, you pass the, re the, the regulation and then you begin to debate what it means and there's, there's a whole set of questions of interpretation and implementation. It was also very clear how little um, children's experiences or parents' experiences or the ways in which um, digital media are used within the home or used in the school or used in everyday life, how little that gets taken into account. Hence my um, insistence on trying to capture the everyday muddle and mess and nature of everyday life. So the dilemma around the age of consent, that Article 8 in the GDPR, um, has been resolved um, in every country in its own way. Uh, and this is um, my colleague Eva Levens' latest map, which she kind of updates um, almost weekly uh, to try to say, OK, how, as Europe implements this regulation, how old does everyone think a child uh, uh, should be uh, to be um, competent to make decisions about how their data is being used? And what's extraordinary is that everyone, you know, OK, it was only um, some of our um, Brexit press that thought that Europe spoke as a monolith and um, all with the same voice as we see. Uh, there are many different decisions. Even I've been trying to track how those decisions are being made also with our colleague John Carr and I've yet to hear any of them that have taken into account evidence from children, from children's experiences, children's um, assessment of what they are, that, you know, assessments about how children are capable of giving consent, I haven't seen any that have consulted parents either, though the whole point about the age of consent is that if a child is not deemed able to give consent, then the parent will be consulted before they can use um, online services. So we might say evidence-based policy. Um, unless we have a theory that children genuinely mature faster in these countries than in these countries. Um, and I'm curious about you know, what possible um, uh, developmental theories we might have. There is a kind of a southern Europe, northern Europe, but then I saw the Netherlands down here. I, just, I don't know. Um, probably um, a number of you here watched um, uh, Mark Zuckerberg last week. Uh, saying to American Congress that he would be quite interested in um, GDPR type legislation being implemented in the US. That was about um, a week before he moved 1.5 billion um, users out of GDPR jurisdiction. Um, but nonetheless, he was interested, and he was interested in the express interest in the possibility of um, a Bill of Rights for kids under 16. Uh, what would that mean? In this country, um, uh, Beban Kidron, Baroness Kidron, um, had, has forced an amendment onto the Data Protection Bill, which is currently going through Parliament, which is the way in which Britain is implementing the GDPR in this country, um, to say we need to find a balance between um, children's rights to participate and children's right to protection. And we need to find a balance between uh, what it is that the companies should do in designing and offering their services and what it is that users can be um, held responsible for doing in terms of their, um, the, the decisions that they make and should be held responsible for. And so the Kidron Amendment, as it's now being um, 
described is to say, yes, in this country we will um, deem children at the age of 13 to be capable of giving their consent because then they can use internet um, services without having to get parental consent uh, for each um, service and indeed um, uh, periodically once they've signed up to services. Um, but that doesn't mean that we want to say that 13-year-olds are capable of making all of these complicated decisions about uh, where their data is being used, how it's being sold to their parties, whether or not they're being profiled and so forth. So we're going to pass um, an amendment to the uh, Act which requires privacy by design for 13 to, um, uh, I think, 13 to 17-year-olds in this country. It's interesting to think about what privacy by design for 13 to 17 year olds is going to look like in this country. I think nobody quite knows that the Information Commissioner's Office is um, working on it. Uh, I think it's quite an interesting solution in principle if it can be made to work because it says not just children are incompetent until a certain age and then they are fully competent but it says they are competent to participate in the world, perhaps by the age of 13, but they are not, um, they should not be subject to the full force of the um, commercial wizardry of the online world uh, and the um, companies that drive it until they are 18, uh, at which point they're no longer children. So there's a kind of an interim protection. So, hasn't arrived yet, but already there's been quite a lot of preparatory activity in implementing the GDPR in this and other countries. It does, I think, promise better data protection for everybody. It can hardly be said to be harmonizing across countries or services in the way that it was promised to do. Um, it's posing some quite complex media literacy um, expectations, and I want to say a little more about um, media literacy uh, in a minute, but as I try to think through, and, and as I hear from stakeholders on all sides, oh, it'll be fine because we can get our schools to teach kids how it is that the services are using their data and how it is that they can make wise decisions because ultimately we all want children to be responsible. And I start thinking about some of the requirements that um, uh, have become embedded in the regulation that um, are going to be complicated to teach children, to say the least, not to mention the rest of the population. For example, the distinction, which I think a number of um, uh, child welfare stakeholders have got confused by uh, in the last few weeks or few months, um, the distinction between consenting to a contract, because what it turns out is that by and large, um, Facebook and probably a number of other companies are going to produce are going to process children's data on the grounds of legitimate interest or contract, not on the grounds of consent, but for some kinds of data they're going to process on the grounds of consent. So you're going to consent to a contract, you're going to consent to terms and conditions, but that's not the basis of processing, but for some data, particularly sensitive data and profiling and facial recognition, it's on the basis of consent. It's going to be some quite hard lessons to design, I'm glad that... Uh, Sangeeta's here. She's going to be designing some of those media literacy mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> curricula, I think. Um, what is data? I think everyone is confused about data. Everyone I ever talked to is confused about exactly what is the definition of personal data, what are the boundaries of personal data. Uh, Simone van der Hoff has just um, written a paper making a distinction, perhaps this is standard, um, between um, data that we know we have given and that we kind of understand that we have made a decision about data that is metadata, that is kind of tracking and um, uh, collecting data from the different sites and across the different devices that we use, and then inferred data or um, perhaps profiling data, which is when uh, perhaps Facebook works out how I voted today, uh, even though I've never told it, um, because it's not going to be so hard to infer. Um, <laughs> What else? I think a number of people are surprised, um, I know I am, that the GDPR has a number of um, protections for children and a number of uh, ways in which um, children are particularly specified in the regulation so that their rights should be protected, but there is no requirement on any um, data controller, any company, or indeed any other um, data controller, uh, to discover if the person, if the user is a child. 
So we're kind of back to the days I used to use the, you know, on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. Um, I still think it is, and I nearly dug that out again today, but I think it is still true that on the internet, nobody knows if you're a child. And in all of this regulation, in all of this kind of specification to try to protect people's data um, and build in special, stronger provisions for children, nobody is obligated to discover if you're a child, unless... Um, and the lawyers might correct me if I'm wrong here, but unless it can be established that there is some uh, resulting risk, in which case a risk impact assessment will establish that um, the um, service should have or could have anticipated that um, children in particular are being put at risk for the service. Relatedly, um, the talk was all about how building in parental consent was going to give parents greater involvement, but similarly there was um, not going, uh, seemingly not very much um, obligation to discover um, who is a parent, or indeed is this person the parent of the child. And um, uh, Facebook um, announced in Dublin a couple of weeks ago, um, where I was to somewhat muted but ribald laughter, that a, a parent is the person who says that they're a parent, and if the child says it's a parent, so, um, job done. And yet, as we kind of had these rather, you know, effortful struggles to improve protections for children, as we all recognise the, the kind of explosion of a, a datafied society, we also see ways in which some of this regulation is doing what many of us have feared, which is to place greater restrictions on children's um, right to participate. So WhatsApp just saying, forget it if you're a kid, you're not on anymore. That's the kind of most um, obvious one. There will be others and... Um, It'll be important to track them in the coming uh, months. So I just want to go back and kind of reread what it was that the GDPR thought it was doing um, in what I think is a really nice phrase, um, a recital, not an article, so not um, strictly the letter of the law. But the purpose was to say children merit special specific protection with regard to their personal data as they may be aware, less aware of the risks, consequences and safeguards concerned and given their rights in relation to personal data. So now I just want to turn the focus a little and kind of delve into that question of whether children are less aware um, and what that's going to mean um, for um, their media literacy. And I'll just elaborate that question of awareness and what children should know and could know um, also in relation to the way in which the Information Commissioner's Office is now advising um, all those processing children's personal data, which is to say, and here are these three bases of um, lawful processing again, if you're relying on consent as a company, as a service, indeed as a school or a hospital, you must make sure that the child understands what they're consenting to and we do not exploit any imbalance in power. If you're relying on processing data for the performance of a contract, you must consider the child's competence to understand what they're agreeing to. If you're relying on legitimate interests, you take responsibility for the risks that you may um, result. So these are kind of uh, efforts to provide um, a serious uh, consideration of what it is that children have the capacity to understand and what is in their best interests. So this is where the project, that had it begun in February, um, I would be already, um, so this is where the project I'm, I'm engaged with. Um, and so I'm not going to say anything about the findings because this is literally where I am. Um, but the plan for um, my next year working with colleagues is to try to insert the child's experience and the child's um, views into this um, larger debate that has been going all around them with um, almost no consideration of their, their views. So the purpose, the project that we have with the Information Commissioner's Office is to get um, understanding, <coughs> a better understanding of how children from the ages of 11 to 16, which you can now see is precisely across the kind of various contested age points, how do they understand, what are they doing with their data, um, what are their vulnerabilities, to identify some lessons for policy and... God help me to try to build a toolkit to explain to them where their data is going and how they might um, uh, be better able to make wise decisions about that. So I don't know how you begin a research project, but I drew a mind map of all the things that I thought should somehow be involved uh, 
and started scribbling like mad. And my research team began to look more and more worried about all the things that I thought was part of this project. <laughs> and so I then tried to um, systematize it a little bit. And I think the struggle with a project that sounds quite kind of focused, but very quickly kind of becomes much larger, is that we are trying to understand what at the moment I'm calling, we can call privacy and data literacy, as um, a new phenomenon in a way. I mean, something that didn't, you know, there wasn't this kind of phenomenon before. Children were not targeted. Um, uh, children's, children's everyday activities didn't generate data traces. That data wasn't previously monetized, um, and nor was it regulated. So it's a kind of new phenomenon that children have to understand. So what is it part of? Well, in one sense, it's part of ch childhood, the way children are socialized, the questions of their capability, well-being, questions of their rights, um, in a kind of sociocultural frame. It also obviously raises a whole series of questions about privacy, which we can think of in different ways, and usually, in relation to children, people think about it in interpersonal terms, less so commercial <coughs> state or indeed children's and privacy within the public sphere, but clearly has kind of legal framing. And then there's a whole set of questions about the digital and the kind of infrastructures that are involved. Um, what are the affordances of the different kinds of spaces that children engage in? Is it possible to um, uh, support um, uh, privacy by design and so forth? And the kind of very immediate questions are at the intersections around media literacy and norms and what it is that children um, are learning and know more generally, what kind of risks and opportunities they're seeking to engage in um, in their lives and indeed also online. And then how much can that regulation kind of relate to the um, data economy that children now find themselves in. So I'm coming towards where I wanted to be by this time. Uh, so I want to say a little bit more about that question of awareness and capacity. What is it that we could say and know that children um, can understand? So as I go around all these different kind of stakeholder um, debates, what I hear over and over again is we want more digital or media literacy for children. We want them to understand better, and if they understood better, then we wouldn't need so much regulation, and there wouldn't be such a burden on companies because the kids would be. Um, so it's much called for. It's very, it's much harder to find ways in which um, media literacy programs are implemented at any scale in this country. In fact, it's much easier to find ways in which the Department of Education has um, uh, rebutted repeated uh, urgings to put. Um, media literacy and media education into the school curriculum. It's quite easy to find ways in which it's been happy to allow um, media literacy to drop from the Audiovisual Media Services Directive, which was the one place where it was kind of written into the European level of regulation. Um, we have lots of fabulous examples of media literacy um, projects. We don't um, see them very much evaluated. We don't see them very much sustained. And we see a kind of hope that couldn't we do a one-shot campaign and tell everyone, oh, you've got data, you're making data wherever you go, these are your rights, this is where you get redress, and then it'll be a kind of a neat piece of messaging. There's beginning to be a recognition that um, literacy depends on legibility, and I see that in the transparency debate. In other words, people begin to see that you cannot teach people, anybody actually, not just children, um, how their data is being used if there is no kind of transparency over when data is moved from a platform to a third party um, or uh, how it is that um, uh, a campaign has been, t uh, advertising has been targeted at you on the basis of which data and whether you have redress there. Um, there is rather little recognition in this world um, in, the, in the stakeholder debates of what everyone knows in the world of education, which is if you just provide information, then you tend to exacerbate inequality because you get a knowledge gap problem where those who are listening and attuned, like, um, uh, will get the message, and those who are busy, are pressed, suffering various disadvantages, <coughs> whatever, will be much likely, less likely. Um, to, to, to grasp the, the kind of the significance of those messages. And then I think a particular struggle in this world um, 
It's very hard to see what it is you are going to teach children as they try to take responsibility for their data, because if, they, if it is a matter of saying yes to everything the service wants to do or not being on the service, if it's not a real choice, children will shrug their shoulders and say, why do I need to know all this? You know, I want to be on Instagram, so you know, there's nothing I can do about it. Instagram's not going to offer me any real choices, which it doesn't, so why, am I even, why are you even trying to um, explain all of this? So there are some kind of things we know about media literacy in general. And then there are some things we can begin to know a little bit about how children um, uh, particularly understand the commercial world that the internet affords them. Um, so this is one example from Ofcom's uh, research last year. Um, for those who don't know, Ofcom does a, um, probably the biggest um, annual surveys of the British public uh, on a yearly basis, asking the same questions every year, which is fantastically helpful. So this was just one um, a question in their survey, um, which was to say, um, what's going on with the things that have the little orange sticker that says add? What is this site doing? Um, and they asked this of children, and they asked it of adults, actually. Here's the data for children. And the question, the question was, can you say this is an ad? Do you understand that you're being advertised to when you see a website that says ad? Um, and for children across our kind of critical GDPR age, um, what you can see is that by 13, um, around about a third of them have figured out that a thing called an ad is an ad. Um, so there's a lot of people not grasping the most obvious things. Um, it gets better by the time you're 15 or 16, which is what Europe thought would be a good kind of age of consent. It doesn't get much better after that um, <laughs> when you go up to 70, so it kind of tails off. So we've done it by social class just to make the point um, about inequalities, which is that if you have kind of bright line cutoffs that say at 13 we will treat you this way, you will advantage those who are more educated and more privileged more than those um, who are not. It also, I think, makes the point that there is no, and we've, we've looked at lots of Ofcom's data, none of it gives any kind of indication that something is happening here or indeed that something is happening here. So if you're going to say at a certain kind of magic age, that's when people understand. Um, here's um, one more question. I'm not going to give you too many of these. Um, when you type a keyword, in, when you type something into a search engine, how do you judge what you get? Do you think some of the websites will be accurate and unbiased and some won't be? Or do you think that if Google gives you the website, it'll be accurate and unbiased? I hope it's obvious that orange is the wrong answer. Here's across the whole age range now. It's not great. There's a lot of people in this country who think that if they put a search term into Google or whichever, it'll all be correct. Yes, you can see that kids are a bit more confused than adults. Actually, you can see that older people are a bit more confused. There's something very funny going on here, which is really bothering me. Um, <laughs> but um, maybe this is a kind of age of doubt, or maybe this is just the squeeze middle, and they're very, very busy and don't have time to <laughs> think. But, um, but there are no kind of, you know, no very obvious cutoffs, and no very, not the strongest justification in the world um, for saying that. Um, children need much better protection than others. Um, when you explain to people what's happening with their data, they're cross. When you explain to kids what is happening with their data, and the Children's Commission has been doing several pieces of work recently um, in uh, trying to understand um, and trying to make the terms and conditions of the, of the, of the services much more uh, clear, at that point kids say, oh, that's weird, I don't like that, why would they take all my data, why would they use it in that way, why wouldn't I have the right to um, um, make more nuanced decisions so they don't, but these are not choices that children are really being given even if, and the GDPR does say, everyone must be explained too much better, everybody should, as from May 25th understand the terms and conditions of all the services that they sign up to. That's now the regulation. 
Um, a couple of months ago, we uh, decided um, we should ask parents, and we asked parents at what age did they think their children um, are uh, competent to make decisions independently online. And this is a plot of the age of the parent's child from 0 to 17, and the age at which the parent thinks the child is independent and able to um, use the internet um, themselves. <laughs> So what's annoying about this graph is that the mean is 13, so the government is right. <laughs> what did some people's head in um, is that the mode is 16, so that also shows that Brussels was right. <laughs> but of course, what a very simple plot tells you is that if your child is anything up to about 7 or 8, you think they'll be absolutely sensible by the time they're um, you know, at secondary school. But if your child is 13, oh, no, hang on a sec, next year, <laughs> next year. And if your child is 14, you say, oh, next month, but, you know, not quite yet. Um, so when parents have got teenagers, they know that they're not quite ready to make those independent. They still want to be involved, but that doesn't mean they want to have to give consent to everything in a kind of verified, um, uh, surveillance kind of way. But I do think it shows you the... Um, the more nuanced way in which parents um, parents are, all, uh, uh, are are kind of thinking about the capacity and competence of their child and therefore their responsibility to do something about it. Um, just a couple of other findings from that survey. Um, actually, this we asked the question about what might limit or people's access to the internet, thinking this was going to be about access, and it didn't occur to me until we saw the findings. But being worried about privacy has become one of the key things that limits people's um, use of the internet. And maybe we're going to see this more. So this graph shows um, low frequency users who tend to be um, poor, people who are struggling with connectivity, who are quite worried. And um, among the high frequency, which is the vast majority of parents, even though the figures are all low, privacy is their number one, um, the number one concern, which actually limits the way in which they um, use the internet. Why? Partly because people are worried about their skills. So when we ask people about the kinds of things that they can do, including can you manage your privacy settings, for example, can you even grasp that? This is a question to parents and to parents of 9 to 12 year olds and parents of 13 to 17 year olds. And what you see is that parents have not, the parents are themselves not sure or sure that they can manage um, a number of key online skills. They are generally sure that their teenagers know better than them, which is not a surprise, but matters in relation to the, um, uh, some of the uh, assumptions about in, the, in the regulation about how parents should retain um, control. Um, and they're also generally clear that they know better than their 9 to 12 year olds, which um, is encouraging, but that's largely because they're not very sure at all that they're kids know so much, but they know, you know, they're learning. So I'm going to try to come to a conclusion. Um, first, I just, I hope that the kinds of argument and evidence I've um, offered so far allow us to uh, throw out or reveal as myths a whole host of things which are said, which I hear. Uh, daily in kind of stakeholder um, context. So I still hear over and again that children are digital natives and parents are digital immigrants. It's the most persistent myth, though I know um, many have um, uh, criticised it. I still hear, therefore, that kids are all savvy or, on the contrary, that they're all vulnerable. Um, I think we're still struggling to get better evidence to show that kids do care about their privacy. Um, I know it every time I talk to them. It's um, hard to... Uh, advocate the kids care when you see that they do, um, as it were, simply sign up to all kinds of services without reading terms and conditions. Um, there's a kind of new line emerging in the last little while that parents not only can't be bothered, but they actively teach their children to lie. That's one of the things that parents do. Um, there is a great hope for the magic switch. It's like, you know, when is my child old enough to have a mobile phone, which journalists ask me weekly. It's also, when is my child old enough to go on social media? And it's like, when is that switch? 
I have to assume that those stakeholders believe that um, children's um, views are irrelevant and not worth listening to because they don't actively include them in many of the processes. I hear, as I've already said over and again, that um, schools can teach kids everything that they know. And then we hear from other quarters, protection is the key thing, and that's when I want to try to kind of put participation in there, or it's all parents' problems, not ours. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, somebody wrote um, a headline that I thought was really, um, uh, Rachel Withers wrote a headline that I thought was really great, which is to say um, out loud, actually, we're trying to protect kids from a whole series of um, uh, struggles and threats and complexities that, in fact, we as adults um, can't manage either. And maybe we should recognise that this datified world is posing everybody with a whole series of challenges, not um, just uh, kids. And I was quite um, intrigued to see the emergence of that um, argument. Um, I want to just note that the right to privacy in the um, UN uh, Convention on the Rights of the Child is in fact quite a carefully phrased right. It's not an absolute right to privacy. Um, but the UN Convention, which says many things about how children's rights should be managed, um, does say no child should be subject to arbitrary or unlawful interference with his or her privacy, but it limits it to what is unlawful. It's not an absolute right to privacy as a child might understand it. It's quite a kind of carefully phrased right. And then there's quite a lot in there about um, trying to adjudicate the child's best interests in relation to the responsibilities, rights and duties of parents, communities and others. In other words, there's a kind of recognition that the right to privacy, um, which I think we would all want to advocate for ourselves and others, and which the uh, regulation tries to implement, uh, is, needs to be understood as quite a contextual right. And offline, we have found many ways traditionally in which we've kind of managed this, but I think online we are really struggling with that kind of nuance um, of the different norms and the different conventions that might apply uh, in different kinds of settings. We just say, whatever the service, at 13 they'll be able to do this, at 16 they'll be able to do this, their parents should oversee them for this and not that and so forth. It's, it, it's The online world, so far at least, seems to be kind of posing quite a, um, a simple um, and sort of flat landscape in terms of um, understanding. So, um, in a special issue of New Media and Society last year, Amanda Third and I made the argument, which I will hazard here as a, as a way of wrapping up, uh, to say that it's, though children, of course, are, do merit particular rights and do have particular um, uh, grounds for vulnerability and questions about their capacity, in fact, those are quite hard to document. And what's particularly hard to document uh, is that they, their vulnerabilities or um, struggles with capacity are obviously greater than those of the rest of the population. And therefore, we hazarded the view that um, if one could get the digital world right for children, it would be right for everybody, or indeed looked at the other way. If you uh, improved the um, protections for privacy, but also the opportunities to participate for everybody, that would be a better world for children. And what is particularly problematic is efforts which kind of hive off the child as a special place for consideration, as if the adult world is in invulnerable, as if all those vulnerabilities only apply in relation to children and not in relation to um, the rest. Because if we think about what we want for children, and this is my last slide, uh, if we think about what we want for children, I think, and I hear this too, we would say we want this for everybody. We want children and the online world struggles to offer this, to have time and opportunity to learn. We want them to be able to make mistakes and, and recover, not to have their data, as it were, um, uh, lock them into their mistakes and problems forever. We want them not to have their vulnerabilities exploited, to be able to experiment and make changes in their lives, in their identity. We want them to explore. You can't say to a parent anymore, I'd love you to, exp you know, you can't ask a parent to let their child explore on the internet anymore. It's just like panic. Oh my God, explore. <laughs> but that's, that was the vision, right? We want children to be able to join in, not to be hived off into kind of child, 
um, walled gardens. We want children to be um, to enjoy privacy in private, by which I mean not having their parents kind of decide on absolutely everything that they can do and monitor everything they do. And we want them to have privacy in public spaces, in the public world, not to have to go out and be there surveilled. Um, and we want them to be consulted on matters that affect them, which is, in fact, Article 12 of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, um, ratified by all, uh, exceeded to by few. So thank you very much. Well done.